we're off. Okay. Welcome to the Advent study of 2020 at St. Timothy's Episcopal Church in Creve Coeur, Missouri. Uh, we will be studying women in the Bible each week. We will focus on two women in the Bible. This week we are focusing on Sarah, wife of Abraham, and Rebecca, wife of Isaac. Uh, also, I've dubbed them legacy makers. So let us pray. Let me minimize this really quick. Okay, let us pray. O oh God, who calls us to unexpected things, we give you thanks for the blessings you bestow upon us, especially the ones we do not see coming. Grant us, we pray, the bravery to follow where you lead, that with your servants, Sarah and Rebecca, we find in our trust the glory of your love through you who comes again and again to bring us back into your presence. Amen. So we're going to start with Sarah since she comes first in the, in the Bible. Um, so here's some fun facts about Sarah. Her name is originally Sarai, which means my lady or my princess in Hebrew. She was so beautiful, it worried Abraham. And twice he um, passed her off as his sister so that she, so that his life would be spared and uh, she would, she would not be taken from him. Um, Sarah and Abraham both had a sense of humor. They're caught laughing many times, a couple of times in their story, um, but they just have bad timing. And we'll learn more about that. Sarah was 90 years old when she gave birth to Isaac, which is depicted in the picture. If you can see, I think it's a striking image um, just of the, uh, the thought of a 90 year old woman having a baby. Um, she's the oldest woman in the Bible to bear a child. And unless there's some um, ex you know, extraordinary uh, person in throughout history who is older than that, um, I, I would assume that she's probably the oldest. Sarah is mentioned more times in the Bible than Mary, the mother of Jesus. Sarah is the only woman in the Bible whose age is mentioned at the time of her death. She was 127 years old when she passed. She, her husband, Abraham, Isaac, um, they are all buried in the same place and their tomb is still venerated today. They are buried at the, in the cave of the patriarchs and traditions say that both, um, both Abraham and Sarah, as well as Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah are all buried there. Come on. So Sarah's story. Sarah is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 11. Named Sarai and Abraham, when we enter the story, God commands that they leave their home in Haran, the first of many moves for them, and travel to Canaan, where Abram is promised an heir by God. Famine comes to the land. It's pretty common throughout the Bible that famine comes and forces people to move from their homes, uh, and the couple is forced into Egypt. They enter the country as aliens. And Abram acknowledges Sarai's beauty for the first time. And not for the first time in his life, but for the first time in this story, um, I assume. And his fear that because she's so beautiful, that Pharaoh will have him killed and take Sarai for himself. Sarai agrees to tell Pharaoh that she's Abram's sister and not his wife in order to protect his life. Sarai is taken into Pharaoh's house. And in return, Abram is given sheep, oxen, slaves, donkeys, and camels. God then, seeing what's going on, sends a plague to, upon the house of Pharaoh and the truth about Sarai's relationship to Abram is revealed. They are then sent away from Pharaoh's house and they return to Canaan. Over the next 10 years, the main um, cause of strife in their lives is their inability to have children. Um, God has already promised Abram that he will have an heir and it has not happened. Sarai believes that God is preventing her from having children and this causes her to send her slave girl, Hagar, who we'll learn more about next week 
in to Abram to fulfill God's promise to Abram of an heir. Hagar conceives and immediately turns on Sarai treat, and starts treating her with contempt. In response, Sarah, it says Sarah deals harshly with her. Don't quite know what that means, but it causes, it's bad enough that it causes Hagar to run away. God intervenes with Hagar and she returns and gives birth to her son, Ishmael. Like I said, we'll discuss more about Hagar's story next week. 13 years go by and Abram has been renamed by God, Abraham and Sarai, Sarah. God blesses Abraham and promises him again that he will have descendants and land. Three days after this blessing, three messengers appear, appear to um, oh, three messengers appear um, outside the tent of Abraham and Sarah. Um, Sarah goes in to prepare refreshments for the guests, and one of the men announces that Sarah, who's now 90 years old, will have a child in one year. We know from our fun facts what Sarah's response to overhearing that prediction was. She laughs. Before the prophecy can be fulfilled, however, Sarah and Abraham take yet another trip, this time to a place called Gerar, which we're going to hear more about in Rebecca's story. Gerar is ruled by King Abimelech. The scenario that had occurred in Egypt is repeated. King Abimelech, overwhelmed by Sarah's stunning beauty, wants to take her for his own wife, which would have to mean eliminating Abraham as the existing husband. So again, in order to spare Abraham's life, <clears throat> Abraham claims that Sarah is his sister, not his wife. We learn in this iteration that Sarah is in fact the daughter of Abraham's father, but not the daughter of his mother. So she is his half sister. Half -sister. <laughs> God comes to Abimelech in a dream and reveals that Sarah is Abraham's wife. Like the Egyptian Pharaoh before him, the king gives Sarah back to Abraham and sends them away with many gifts. And they move on encouraged by Abimelech to live anywhere in his land they desire, which I think is just very generous um, and not like many of the stories of kings and pharaohs that we hear about late in other places in the Bible. So um, a year later, God does fulfill his promise to Sarah and she conceives and bears a son who they name Isaac, which means he laughs. Not, uh, I don't think that's coincidence. Sarah, who I suspect has a sense of humor, um, responds by saying, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. In this instance, the laughter is in joy rather, in shocked, rather than in shocked belief, like it was when the messengers told Abraham that she would bear a child in one year. Um, Sarah, even in her advanced age, nurses Isaac not a wet nurse, and he grows up. On the day he is weaned, the family celebrates with a feast, during which Sarah observes something in the play between Isaac and Ishmael. What she sees isn't explained, but whatever it is, causes Sarah to tell Abraham to send Ishmael and Hagar away, denying Ishmael a share of Abraham's inheritance. Reluctantly, Abraham turns to God for guidance, and God tells him to listen to Sarah and to do as Sarah says. Abraham sends Hagar and Ishmael away with the understanding that Ishmael's future will be safeguarded, but God's promise will be fulfilled through Isaac. Sarah lives until the age of 127 and is the only woman in scripture whose age at the time of death is given. There are references to Abraham's mourning and weeping. Sarah embodies the message of Advent, uh, Advent's hope. There is always hope for new life, even in circumstances of apparent barrenness. She teaches us to laugh, even to laugh in response to God's message of hope for us, and to laugh with one another in joy. Is anything too wonderful for God? So now um, I'm, let me check the time. Okay, that didn't take as long as I thought it was going to, so this is good. 
Now I'm going to split you all into breakout rooms, and I'd like you to discuss these two questions. Why did God choose Sarah to be the spiritual matriarch of the Jewish people? What gifts did she have that helped God bring God's covenant to fulfillment? And the spiritual roots of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam spring from this story, with angst and despair going back to the very conceptions of Ishmael and Isaac. What do you think that says about world religions today? I will copy and paste these questions in the chat and um, so that you have those. And I don't have like leaders for each group, but um, you know, embolden yourselves and uh, just start just start chatting, okay? So um, let me get you guys split up and then I will put that um, put that stuff in the chat, so. Here we go. I'm going to put you into three breakout rooms just so that everybody has a chance to talk and I'll bring you back in about 10 minutes. Okay. I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. So uh, in the previous slides, I hope you noticed that there was artwork for, um, for each slide. And they're all depictions of Sarah um, in various uh, ways. So the first, um, the first image is an icon, an Orthodox icon of St. Sarah. Um, Orthodox icons are sacred images used in religious devotion. This shows Sarah, obviously. Um, her gray hair um, shows her age. And in her left hand is a scroll. In some of the icons that depict her, the scroll, the scroll is open to read, who shall, say Abraham, who shall say to Abraham that Sarah suckleth a, ch a child? For I have born a child in my old age. The second image is by the artist Renata Fuchikova in a painting called The Promise, um, which is, this image was used in a book called Stories from the Old Testament, which was only um, printed in France and the Czech Republic, I think. The third image uh, is a painting by a Netherlands artist named Jan van Hoff, who uh, has an extensive collection of religious paintings at, um, at his website, which is gospelimages.com. So um, I encourage you to go and, and find more images of these women as they're depicted uh, in art and in iconography, because it's really fascinating to see how people um, take these stories and turn them into something um, visual that we can be, mm -hmm. that can be seen. Beautiful. Um, what did the, oh, let me back up here. What do these images, if anything, um, bring up for you? What strikes you? I really like the last one because it gets across the age um, and it's almost like her sense of humor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's smiling. Anybody else? I like the middle one uh, also. Well, I like them all, but depicting them looking upward, gazing yeah. to the heavens, looking for God. Mm -hmm. um, that's very peaceful, even though a, you know, there's just something about it. Mm -hmm. Good. Anybody the else? The acceptance uh, or the praying for intervention and then accepting yeah. whatever, you know, it reminds me of uh, pictures of uh, the Blessed Virgin uh, when she accepted 
um, the news <laughs> from the angel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In that last picture, she looks so happy and and at peace. He looks absolutely awestruck, just um, speechless. Yeah, and such a cool picture of both of them. Yeah, yeah. I was excited to. Uh, well, I can only see her. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Maybe we need to oh. the um the the line of boxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was really excited to stumble onto this artist because his website is chock full of these incredible uh, images of many many stories throughout the Bible. So that's why I put the um, the website there. So I hope you'll take note of that and go and um, discover more about about his work. Um. Okay, we really need to move on to Rebecca, so we're gonna keep we're gonna keep trucking here. Um, some fun facts about Rebecca: she is actually Abraham's great niece, um, and she's the woman who speaks the most words in Genesis. Um, she leaves her home without question to marry a man she's never met, and she's one of the few women um, in Scripture to converse directly with God. Mm. So Rebecca's story. Rebecca is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 24. Um, and her story actually begins with Abraham. Abraham, uh, we jump forward uh, after um, Sarah's death. Abraham, who is also well advanced in years, sends a servant of his to his homeland of Aram Naharaim, it, which is the upper Euphrates region of northern Syria, to find Isaac a wife. The servant takes with him 10 camels and makes his way. Upon his arrival in the town of Haran, Jacob's hometown, he meets Rebecca at a spring of water. We learn that Rebecca's grandfather is the brother of Abraham, which makes her Abraham's great niece. Rebecca's first act is one of hospitality as she gives the servant water to drink as well as plenty of water for his camels. Rebecca is rewarded by Abraham's servant with a gold nose ring and bracelets for her wrists. Rebecca offers to shelter the servant for the night and she brings him to her family home where we meet her mother, father, and her brother Laban. The servant explains the charge given him by Abraham. Laban and Bethuel, Rebecca's father, agree to send Rebecca to Isaac. Rebecca is also, however, consulted and given a choice in the matter and she agrees to go with the servant um, with no argument. Upon their return to Abraham and Isaac, Rebecca sees Isaac uh, in a field. He had gone to walk in the fields and has a love at first sight moment. And she quickly veils herself for her future husband. The servant presents Rebecca to Isaac with an explanation of how this all came to be in his travels and his now successful mission. And Isaac takes Rebecca into his home, which was Sarah's tent, and they come together as man and wife. Like Sarah, Rebecca has trouble conceiving a child. In fact, we learn that 20 years pass between the marriage of Isaac and Rebecca and the birth of Esau and Jacob. Isaac mm -hmm. prays to the Lord, and the Lord eventually grants his prayer and Rebecca becomes pregnant with twins. The pregnancy is an extremely difficult one as the children, uh, foreshadowing, struggle together in her, room, in her womb. Rebecca asks the Lord, if it is to be this way, why do I live? In unusual form, uh, the Lord responds directly to her. Two nations are in your womb and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. The twins are born, Esau first, his name literally meaning red and hairy, and Jacob meaning God may God protect, who arrives gripping the heel of his brother. Esau grows to be a very skillful, skillful hunter and becomes the favorite of Isaac, and Rebekah comes to favor Jacob. Jacob tricks his brother into selling his birthright to him in exchange for lentil stew and bread because hunger makes us do crazy things. 
<laughs> famine comes to the land, and as we know is very common, and Isaac and Rebecca are forced to the same place that Sarah and Abraham left, went the second time, to Gerar. In wildly parallel fashion, Rebecca's beauty and Isaac's fear of being killed for her causes Isaac to pass her off as his sister, and she enters the house of King Abimelech, who's still alive. Unlike Sarah's story, however, Rebecca and Isaac are seen by the king as they are being intimate, and the king gives Rebecca back her fidelity to her husband intact. In Isaac's old age, his sight fails, and he calls Esau to him and asks him to hunt game and prepare a meal for him in exchange for his blessing. Rebecca overhears this request and favoring Jacob schemes a plan to place the blessing upon Jacob instead. She prepares a meal with meat from their own flock and dons Jacob with the hides of the goats so to trick Isaac into believing he was Esau because Esau as we know was hairy and Jacob was smooth skinned. Isaac blesses Jacob, believing him to be Esau. When Esau returns and takes the meal that his father had asked him for into his tent, Isaac refuses to bless him as, uh, to, refuses to bless him as well, having already given lordship to Jacob. This causes Esau to hate his brother. And Esau hates his brother for twice deceiving him, and he plots to kill Jacob. Rebecca learns about this plot and convinces Isaac to send Jacob to her brother Laban. He agrees and Rebecca saves the life of her favored child. Mm. So, um, I don't think we're gonna split up again just because we only have 15 minutes left, um, but I would like to just hear some of your thoughts to these questions. The first question is, um, some say that Rebecca was a woman of deceit, yet God had told her that Jacob would be the stronger twin and that the older would serve the younger. Given that knowledge and knowing she was a daughter of this covenant, did she interfere with God's work or help it along? What do you think? I would say she interfered. Yeah. I would um, too. Because sometimes, and, and I see it in prayer a lot of times, Sometimes we pray our will on somebody else's life. And it seems to me that she is putting her will into the situation to make sure things come out the way she wants it to come out. Mm. I think she's being a mother. Yes. And saving her child. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have a, uh, the other opinion? Does anybody hold the other opinion that she helped along God's will? I, I don't know, my gut says she helped along, but I can't really back it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is that we don't know how God would have would have made this happen without mm -hmm. Rebecca's inter intervention, right? So we don't have an alternate ending to the story. Um, so we don't know, we can't know um, whether or not, you know, or how God would have, would have brought this to, to be. So, um, what qualities did Rebecca possess in her youth that helped her midlife? Don't all talk at once. <laughs> it seems that she would do, she would behave, do what was asked of her. Okay. So I was going to say almost the opposite, that I think that she was rather brave and bold. I mean, she's going off in her youth to marry somebody she's never met before based on a guy coming with a bunch of camels to water them, right? So, um, and so, and then she's sort of brave and scrappy in how she uh, helps, you know, Jacob get the inheritance as well, so. Yeah, excellent. I guess it didn't occur to her that he was over 90 years old and she just went and accepted what her family apparently told her to do. And, uh, you know, that, that would be 
and she was, uh, how old was she? Was she very young? Um, we don't know exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. that uh, when she married Isaac, Isaac was 40 years old and was 60 when the twins were born. Okay. But we don't know, we don't have, um, we don't have the context of her age. We don't have that information. Yeah. But it, I mean, you can assume that since she's living in her family's house and she is unmarried, um, scripture also tells us she was a virgin. Um, yes. But she was yeah. probably pretty young. Mm -hmm. She also has a servant's heart. Mm -hmm. um, you see that in her giving well, the water to them and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She has the gift of hospitality. That's mm -hmm. her first action. And she brings this complete stranger back to her family's house to give him shelter for the night. And mm -hmm. he's got all these camels and he has people with him, which means they're putting up a bunch of people in their house, having never, having never seen these folks before. Mm -hmm. So good. Good. Any other thoughts before we move on? Well, I guess she kind of knew her mind. I mean, she was, yeah. Yeah. you know, self-possessed person and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, um, lived what she thought and felt yeah well they were a family because i mean if she was his abraham's niece they were family so at least i mean they had that connection yeah you know and the servant did not know that she was family to abraham until after he had been talking to her for quite some time um she revealed her lineage to him and then um it all kind of came together so that was definitely a god moment where Rebecca was the first person that he met, and she just happened to be family to Abraham and the person he was looking for. So I, I have a question. So it, it seems like, um, and, there, and there may be more examples, I, I, I think there are, that of um, conception in the, in the Old Testament, stories of conception at, at old, very old ages, and, um, um, and other feats um, in, in the men too, but um, I'm wondering, is there something symbolic in the Jewish religion um, about that? Because I, I, well, I question the accuracy of the counting of the years. Um, so, um, but, it, you know, am I, am I missing something deeper? That's an excellent question, Leslie, that I don't have an answer to. Um, so I, I'm, I'd be happy to, to do some research for you and try to see if there's any um, information about the symbolism or the, um, about the importance of the woman's age. I think um, my, my suspicion is that um, these incredible feats are told to bring glory back to God, that God mm -hmm. does impossible things and has right. done impossible things from from the beginning of, of humanity. So yeah. that would be my guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Okay. I like it. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> um, okay, any other, any other thoughts before we move on to the artwork? I, I love the fact that she didn't seem to be afraid to speak out. Just, you, you talked about um, her, how much she spoke in Genesis, mm -hmm. and also that she spoke directly to God. Uh, and I, I find that uh, refreshing for that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I, um, I also, I, I was like, oh gosh, if I had to, if I had to identify with either Sarah or Rebecca, it would be Rebecca because yeah. I, I mean, it's hard for me to not talk. So. <laughs> Exactly. Well, Rebecca obviously has a brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. She's she's very. I mean, she comes up with. She sees this big picture and she comes up with these um, plans. Right. right. She, she puts things the way that she wants them, and often it is through dece through deception. But I mean, she's doing it because God did give her this charge, and um, you know she's she's watching all of the pieces as they fall into place. And I think too, she's extremely outspoken, um, but also she knows what the plan should be. Mm -hmm. God has told her what the plan should be. And in a sense, come hell or high water, it's <laughs> gonna happen because God told her. Yeah. 
-hmm. Yep, she's given, she took, she took God's covenant as a charge for her to make that happen. Right. She, I mean, and she took it and did exactly what she decided she wanted to do with it. So, and it came and I see her as a strategist, not deceitful. No. <laughs> <laughs> women that I can find um, icons for, I will, um, just because I love iconography and um, I love the way that women are depicted in icons. This is an Orthodox icon of St. Rebecca. Um, in other versions of icons, she's holding a pitcher of water, which is very, um, very telling, right? It's part of, it's a big part of her story. It's what got her started, right, on her journey with Isaac. So, um, in this iteration, she is holding a scroll, and in um, in other depictions of this icon, the scroll is open to read, "May you become the mother of thousands of myriads." Wow! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second image is another um, another painting by Jan van Toff, um, which shows the servant giving her the bracelets after she has watered his camels. You can see the nose of the camel um, coming in, but I couldn't get the whole the whole image in there. So um, I encourage you to go to that website and look it up. Oh, yeah. okay. And then the third image is um, called The Blessing of Jacob, uh, which is a painting by Dutch master Govert Flink. Um, you can see in the image that um, that Isaac is touching Jacob's hand and he's wearing hairy gloves, it looks like, right? To deceive his father into believing that he's Esau. And you see Rebecca watching the whole, the whole thing happen as uh, Isaac blesses, excuse me, sorry about that, um, as Isaac blesses Jacob. So um, what, what do these images bring up for you? What strikes you? Why is Rebecca's left hand covered? Why is her left hand covered under her shawl in the first picture? Um, that is an excellent question, Susan. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But I would be happy to find um, out for you. I know the left hand was, um, you know, the right hand was the favored hand yeah. in history, but um, that just jumped out at me right away. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, and I'm sure there are explanations for that, um, but I did not do that extensive research. So I, I will, if you want me to. I'll do it, thanks. I got time. I'll be interested to hear what you find out. So please share. It that. looks like in all of the pictures, her left hand is covered. Yeah. That's her right hand. Oh yeah. In the last picture and her left hand is covered in the second picture. And, and I, Kimmy, I think you're right on about, you know, left is, um, has always been the um, improper, the wrong, the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the dark. So um, that, that's probably it. You know, and it may just be a sign of her, um, you know, she, she's doing all of these, all of these things, um, everything that she's making um, come to pass. She's doing it kind of under the current, right? She's the one who's kind of driving that. And so, I mean, it may just be um, like a shroud for the things that she's doing. Um, it may be a sign of her, um, of her betrothal to Isaac, um, which she was given the option, but also her brother and her father said, yeah, you can have her. So it may be, it may be a symbol of that. It, I mean, it could have many, 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 um, what is the scroll? What, what is the scroll of? I missed that. Oh, the scroll says, um, may you become the mother of oh, thousands okay. of myriads. Okay. Hmm. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Any other thoughts about these? I was thinking maybe an early depiction of the Torah and the reverence for the Torah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard the phrase, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm looking at this, it just reminds me of that. Oh. Because in all yeah. of those pictures, that's her right hand. Yeah, that's very astute. That's right. Yeah. See, I think oh. 
I think that's the, what icons do so beautifully is they bring up questions and make us consider what, what those answers could be. And it makes us consider her whole story and, and really, um, really suss out what, what those images bring up for us. So. When I was a child, um, I'm left-handed mm -hmm. and we were punished right. uh, by the teachers and the nuns um, if we wrote with our left hand and I'd be slapped and it was uh, considered sinestra, which is sinister, uh, mm -hmm. to be or to write with your left hand. So, and that, um, like it comes from the devil and, you know, I mean, it can just go on and on. Um, and um, they, they didn't give up until third grade. And then those of us that continued to write with our left hand were left alone and it wasn't mentioned again. <laughs> wow. But yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, in Islam... Like there is mm -hmm. also a, um, a favor of the right side of the body. Like um, people in Islam are, uh, they sleep on their right side because if they sleep on their left side, it is the, um, it is the sinister side mm -hmm. of the body is what they mm -hmm. believe. And so ah. they make a point to always, they, they probably correct their children in, in their right, writing, which hand they favor and as far as on their right side. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, I am very aware of the time. Um, so I, I just want you to um, consider how these women um, relate to one another, having never met, but sharing um, the same family. Um, think about what parallels come into their lives um, and what characteristics they share as they um, are the vehicles for this, for this legacy that God has, um, has, has covenanted to these men. So I want you to just take those questions with you and consider them and we can um, revisit them next week if you want to. And um, Cam, Cammie, can you send us uh, or give us the biblical references to read? I'm very weak on my Old Testament books, and I'd, I'd really like to be able to read these passages. Yes. So uh, after this session, I will send to everyone um, the notes, all the notes that I took um, to prepare this and also give you all the biblical references. So you'll have all these questions as well. So you'll get the whole, the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Um, this was great. I, I enjoyed every detail of it. So I don't think you were overprepared at all. I really loved oh. it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That was um, wonderful. Good. Yes. Thank you so much. Very good. Um, I am going to um, close us with prayer and then um, I'll make sure that you all have all of this um, information this afternoon. So let us pray. Oh Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then in thy mercy, grant us a safe lodging, and a holy rest, and peace at the last. Amen. 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 So, Amen. That is a beautiful prayer. Yeah, it's one of my favorites, and it's in the Book of Common Prayer in the back, in the prayers and thanksgivings. Beautiful. Oh, wow. Um, so next week, we're going to talk about Hagar. So Sarah's... Um, Sarah's servant that she sends in, who has uh, gives birth to Ishmael, and Miriam, who is Moses and Aaron's older sister. They both um, go to extremes to save the children in their lives, and um, I'm really excited to oh, wow. uh, hold their stories up against one another and, and see what we can come up with. So thank you all so much for being here today. I'm so excited. We had 20 people jump on to, well, 21 once Father Joe showed up, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so... Thank you guys so much. I hope this was fruitful. I hope you learned yeah. a lot. I know. Oh, it's wonderful. I talk. I, I know I had to talk kind of fast, but you got all the information, and you'll receive more information. Um, this great afternoon. class. Thank you. Yes, I thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Tammy. Uh, everybody have a great week, and I'll see you uh, next Wednesday. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.
Bye. Bye. <laughs> Good to see everyone. Yes, good to see you, Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. Bye. Bye. <laughs>